Well, I want to welcome everyone to this fellowship this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, God bless you this day and every day in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk this morning about an aspect of spending time with God, spending time with God in meditation. And er earlier this spring, many of you were involved, if, if you missed our series Rooted, Growing as Disciples in Christ that we had on Sundays earlier this spring, I encourage you to find those recordings, um, five wonderful teachings, and the, the, the real guts of it after the introductory session were to talk about four habits of discipleship, the first of which was spending time with God. And Shawnee Vickery did a wonderful job teaching that in that series. And then last week, Jeff Tyler taught spending time with our Heavenly Father. It happened to be Father's Day here in the United States. And Jeff made three very profound points about spending time with our Heavenly Father. Uh, the first was God is always speaking. Are you listening? The word of God has the power to change you. And the third was ask God for the help you need. And one of the closing statements that Jeff made rung in my ears. I thought it was just so profound that spending time with God leads to obedience. Genuinely spending time with God leads to obedience. And we just heard in, in Rob's prophecy <laughs> You know, live as good Christians. That's all about obedience, um, it, it seems to me. Anyway, um, so spending time with the Heavenly Father seems to be something that he wants to communicate and urge us toward at, at this particular time. And so I started thinking, and by the way, I had my topic identified before Jeff taught last Sunday um, I started thinking about the biblical side of meditation. It is a biblical word. We're going to look at it this morning. Um, but what, it, what does it really mean? What was God trying to communicate when he's telling us to meditate? And how does the Bible depict meditation? So I want to open in Psalm 19 with the very verse that Jeff closed with last week. So Psalm 19 and it, Psalm 19 starts out talking about the wonderful works of God, the greatness of God's creation and his works. And it ends with a prayer. And the, the last verse in the psalm is part of that prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your eyes, O Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. And Jeff called it a gritty prayer. And I agree. It's earthy. It's serious. It's, um, it's important. So what is, what is God talking about when he says the meditation of my heart? And, you know, meditation may for you conjure up an image of sitting in solitary quietude, or maybe it conjures up an image of Buddhist monks chanting their Buddhist prayers or their mantras. You know, whatever, whatever experience or encounters you may have had with meditation in your life, it, it can conjure up some pretty unusual images. And when I thought about the phrase meditation of my heart, I'm thinking quietness, internal you know, pondering. And so I, I looked at this, the Hebrew word that is translated meditation in this verse and listen to these definitions. It's the Hebrew word haga. And it means to moan, to growl, to utter, to mutter, to muse, to devise, to plot, to speak. How many of those verbs are active and involve the mouth? <laughs> uh, 
um, it's it's not exactly that picture of sitting in uh, focused but idle quietude. It's very active, very engaged, very involved. A lot of speaking going on there. Um, I, I looked up on Wikipedia just for kicks. What what did Wikipedia say about meditation? So here it is a practice in which an individual uses a technique such as mindfulness or focusing the mind on a particular object, thought or activity to train attention and awareness and achieve a mentally clear and emotionally calm and stable state. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, that's a bunch of garbage. That's, that's not what the Bible says about meditation at all. Then I reread it. <laughs> And if you read that with an idea of God being in it, it really is quite a good definition, in my opinion. An individual uses a technique to train attention and awareness to achieve a mentally clear and emotionally calm and stable state. I mean, we, we know from scripture that God wants us to be mentally clear and calm and stable. How many times does the phrase fear not appear in scripture, Old, Old Testament, Gospels, New Testament? Um, you know, so I thought about well, what is wrong? What is that definition of meditation? Why does it conjure up kind of the wrong, the wrong idea? And I thought, well, because it's, it's the manner in which it's done that um, can, can be done, that strikes us as kind of odd, like the meditating monks and, and all of that kind of thing. And it's also the end result. What is the end result of the meditation of our heart? You know, it's, um, it's not clearing the mind, emptying the mind of all thought, certainly not that. Um, and you know, in contrast to that, as we saw, all those words, moaning, growling, uttering, muttering, musing, glancing, plotting, and speaking, are all very engaged, very active, and very involved. And that is, in you know, according to that Hebrew word anyway, that's what God wants from us. The meditation of our heart is, is active. And we're going to see some verses that, you know, it's, it's all day, it's day and night. I want to go to another occurrence of this Hebrew word, Hagah, Joshua 1. Just a second, sorry. There we are. Okay. So I would assume that many of you are familiar with um, what is going on in Joshua 1. Moses died at the end of Deuteronomy. And of course, the children of Israel had been in the wilderness for 40 years under Moses' leadership and eating manna and, you know, witnessing water coming out of rocks and, and stuff like that when they were thirsty. I mean, Moses' leadership <laughs> was um, so unprecedented and so lofty, relatively speaking. Um, and then he dies. And so after the death of Moses in Joshua 1, verse 1, the servant of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, Yahweh spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, Joshua had been Moses' assistant for the preponderance of those 40 years. So he was no stranger to all the experiences that Moses led them through and no stranger to the idea that their job was going to be to cross over the Jordan and conquer the promised land, um, which was inhabited. I mean, it, it wasn't just a matter of marching in and um, putting up houses. <laughs> Um, so Moses, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross over this Jordan, you and all the people to the land that I am giving them to the children of Israel. So Joshua and all of the Israelites were on the east side of the Jordan River, a little bit to the south. Um, 
and in a very mountainous area. And so they needed to march over to the river and, and cross it and then enter the promised land that they were supposed to conquer. In verse three, every place that the sole of your foot will tread on, I have given you just as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea going toward the going down of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. So those verses talk about God's job, God's side of his promise to bring the people of Israel into the promised land. Now, this is Joshua's job in verse six. Be strong and courageous, for you will cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you will have success wherever you go. And verse eight, this scroll of the law must never cease being spoken out of your mouth, but you are to meditate on it day and night so that you can be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Now, I want you to ask yourself something. Here is this crucible moment. Moses is dead. God is speaking to Joshua, commanding him to cross the Jordan and begin to take the land. And how does he tell him to prepare? Does he say, organize your men, sharpen your weapons, make sure the women and children have shelter, Get your food and your supply chain in order. All very understandable things that would need to be done, right? But that's not what God talked about. He talked about meditating on the commandments, not letting the law depart from his mouth day and night. And so that the outcome of which is doing um, so that you can be careful to do according to all that is written in it, the law, and then you will make your way prosperous and have good success. It's interesting in the Hebrew language that oftentimes um, a, a verb, in this case like meditate, uh, had a much bigger meaning that drifted not from just from the internal, but to an external result. And I want to read you a little something from a book recommended to me by Janet Speaks. Thank you, Janet. Walking in the Dust of Rabbi Jesus. Um, it is a Christian book, but um, it's written by a woman who spent a lot of time in Israel getting to understand the fact that Jesus really was Jewish. He spoke Hebrew. He came from a Jewish background and culture. And she writes beautifully about the Hebrew language. Um, she says, Hebrew is a word poor language. Biblical Hebrew can, includes only about 8,000 words, far fewer than the 400,000 or more we have in English. Paradoxically, the richest of Hebrew comes from its poverty. Because the ancient language has so few words, each one is like an overstuffed suitcase, bulging with extra meanings that it must carry in order for the language to fully describe reality. Unpacking each word is a delightful exercise in seeing how the ancient authors organized ideas, sometimes grouping concepts together in very different ways than we do. And she goes on to use the example of the verb remember, biblically, like God remembered Noah. And what, what that really means in Hebrew, it's much bigger than our English word remember, where we think of recollection. 
remember in Hebrew implies an action that occurs because of the remembrance. Um, Hebrew verbs stress action and effect rather than just mental activity. And I think our little word haga that's translated meditate is very similar in that, in that there, there's an implied outcome to the meditation. And that implied outcome is doing, making your way, prospering, obeying. Um, meditation, that concept also appears a whole bunch of times in Psalm 119. So let's go there. And in Psalm, in Psalm 119, it's a different, sorry, it's a different Hebrew word. Hang on, get there. Okay. Um, the word that appears in Psalm 119 that's translated meditation, and it does occur a whole bunch of times, is the Hebrew word shiach. Um, and it means, it's very similar to hagah, but listen to this, to put forth, to muse, to commune, to speak, to complain, to ponder, to sing. <laughs> Sounds to me like another overstuffed suitcase. Um, but I, I was intrigued by the translation commune. And I thought, what is, what is communing? What, what does that mean? My, my, my dear friend, George Mueller, <laughs> whom you've heard me talk about, um, so many times this year in my teachings, um, was, it talked a lot. He wrote a lot about communing with God. And he spent the first hour and a half of every day in prayer, in meditation, in study. And he called this communing. And he was adamant about it. I mean, as he trained young ministers, um, he, one of his um, very definitive statements about that time for him was that it was the work of the ministry, that they should not be tricked in thinking, you know, well, um, I do my prayer check, I do my study check, and then I get on with all the tasks of the work of the ministry. He said that time of communing with God um, is... <laughs> the work of the ministry. In Joyce's prophecy this morning, we heard words about walking and talking, that God would do that with us and that we are to do that with him. Um, but I, I wanted to look up communing because I thought, well, like meditation, it could have a lot of different images that might come to the front of your mind. And so I, here's the dictionary definition of communing, to converse or talk together usually with profound intensity, intimacy, et cetera, um, an interchange of thoughts or feelings. Um, one of the things that George Mueller um, was noted for was writing out his prayers. And Jeff, in his teaching last Sunday, mentioned that. You know, it gave us some encouragement to write a prayer. Um, and so I, I just wanted to share with you quickly in a span of time, there were months and months, um, actually it happened several times, where George Mueller in his effort with his orphanages found himself in a position of having only the food for the day or morning or only the supplies to get them through a few hours. And it was a very trying and tedious thing to go through. And, and at this one particular time, it just went on for months and months and months. And so in his prayer time, um, he wrote, <laughs> he wrote to God about that. He says, it is pleased my gracious, it is not pleased my gracious Lord to send me help as yet. Yesterday and today, I have been pleading with God 11 arguments why he should graciously be pleased to send help. And then he wrote out his 11 arguments, one of which was that many enemies would laugh at you if you were to withhold our supplies and they would mock you and they would say, did we not foretell that this enthusiasm, this work of the orphanage is, would come to nothing? So he, he wrote that out with incredible honesty and boldness. Um, 
I think that fits with communing. <laughs> um, so let's let's look. Did, I, did we read a couple verses in Psalm 119? I don't think we did. So in verse 15, we'll just look at a couple of them here because they're they're lovely. In verse 15 of Psalm 119, I will meditate on your precepts and look upon your paths. Again, um, think action and effect rather than just mental activity. Uh, down in verse 23, even though rulers sit and conspire against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your servant will ponder your statutes. And in verse 27, make me understand the road of your precepts. Then I will meditate on your wonderful acts. Well, we have to read about and know the acts in order to meditate on them. That's one thing. Um, and in the, in the previous verse, you know, not to be distracted by people in power who appear to conspire against us, but instead we meditate, we focus on, we are unafraid because of the precepts and the statutes. And then in, uh, in verse 78, There are more of these. I just picked out a few that I really liked. Verse 78, let the insolent be put to shame, for they have oppressed me with falsehood. I will meditate on your precepts. Um, again, think of activity, engagement, and outcome, as opposed to just the mental activity of thinking. You know, it, but here is a, you know, I think about not being distracted. Uh, by the insolent, by oppressors, by liars, but instead we, we focus on the love of God, the truth of God, and we heard it in manifestations this morning over and over and over again, you know, in, in James's um, interpretation of tongues, the magnifying, the wonderful works, the great works, all the incredible things that that God did and has done and continues to do through all the ages. Um, and then the last one I want to talk about is down in 148, verse 148. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I might meditate on your utterance. <laughs> I love that. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I might meditate, that I might ponder, muse, find my little definition again. This is that same word, siak, commune, speak, even complain in the night watches or to put forth. So while speaking of the complaining, <laughs> I, I wanted to explore, you know, what about that? What is the complaining side of meditation? And we know that, um, you know, there's constructive complaining and then there's very destructive complaining. Um, but is, is the complaining side of meditation still acceptable and pleasing in, in God's sight? And again, I wanna go back to this author um, and, and relate to you what she said about this. She's talking about Abraham's bargaining with God over Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember when Ab God said, you know, get, get out, get Lot out, I'm going to destroy the whole city. And Abraham said, oh, please, you know, what if I find 50 righteous people? And God said, oh, okay. Well, what if I find 40? And then, you know, he gets all the way down to 10. And that each time God's response to him was, was um, very positive. And she's, she writes, we might hear Abraham words as appallingly irreverent, but Jewish thought sees his actions positively. His boldness is a sign of his tremendous trust in God. Abraham is like a little boy who keeps tugging on his father's coattails refusing to stop pestering him 
until he gives in. And then she quotes um, a Jewish teacher, Atal Dixon, as writing this, it takes more faith to ask than it takes to fear asking. It takes faith to be ready for whatever answer comes and faith to persevere with more questions if the answer is not understood. Sometimes asking questions is a way to demonstrate humility because inherent in the question is the assumption that I don't have the answer, but God does. Sincere questions give God respect. They acknowledge his power, they honor him. And then um, she says, throughout the Bible, we find faithful Jews addressing their concerns to God with a surprising bluntness. And she quotes Moses in Exodus 5, who after going into Pharaoh and being rejected and then getting Pharaoh's reaction to the first plague, this is how Moses went back to God. Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? <laughs> Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. <laughs> I would agree that that's pretty blunt. And then she says, you hear the same unflinching honesty in David's Psalms and in Job's laments especially, but it winds through the whole scripture. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to um, bring out about the complaining or the muttering side of meditation. We are human and we're humans created by God. We have emotions, we have frustrations, we have exasperations, and sometimes with him, right? And what the scriptures demonstrate is that it's, it's, it's perfectly um, legitimate to go to God with that and say, you know, as George Mueller did, where's the food, Lord? Where's the supplies? I'm getting tired and people are about to be laughing at you. I, I love the honesty. So I think that, you know, the meditation of the Bible is raw. It's honest. It's very real. And it's certainly very active. Then I had to ask myself, did Jesus specifically teach people to meditate? I mean, we saw it in the Old Testament. We've seen a whole bunch of scriptures in the Old Testament. Did he specifically teach about meditation? And my answer to that, again, comes from the same author. I've, I've really enjoyed reading her stuff, as you can tell. Um, the answer lies in the fact that he was a living demonstration of what it was to meditate on the things of God. And the way she expresses that is, is very interesting. She says, I used to think that Jesus' command to make disciples simply meant teaching people certain beliefs about God, helping them accept Christ as Lord, and then educating them in doctrinal truth later on. Though all of these are important, this way of defining discipleship showed that I, like many Westerners, approach the gospel primarily as information. An Eastern view of discipleship seems far more in keeping with the gospel. The Eastern view encompasses the understanding that Jesus died for our sins and that belonging to him involves repenting and receiving him as Lord. But it also recognized that Jesus lived transparently in front of his disciples in order to teach them how to live. They in turn were to live transparently before others, humbly teaching them the way of Christ. This approach involves not just information, but transformation. The end result of spending time with God is obedience. God's goal isn't simply to fill the world with people who believe the right things. It's to fill the world with people who shine with the brilliance of Christ.
So that's how she describes Jesus teaching meditation. He lived it. But I want to go to one section in Matthew, Matthew 11. Because this is what came to my mind as I was thinking about this and praying about it. Did Jesus really, you know, what did he say about meditation? He really didn't say direct things as far as I can find. Now that might be a fun project, you know, to read through the gospels and, and look for it. Maybe I missed something. But what did come to mind is as I was doing that, reading through the gospels, looking for <laughs> teachings on meditation, what came to my mind was this um, final section in Matthew 11. So we pick it up in verse 27. Um, all is Jesus speaking and he's speaking to disciples. All things have been handed over to be by my father. And no one really knows the son except the father. Neither does anyone really know the father except the son and anyone to whom the son determines to reveal him. Come to me. <laughs> All you who are laboring and have been loaded down with burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is kind, and my burden is light. And in, in Jewish rabbinical thinking, the yoke was used to describe the law in a figurative way. They, they, they referred in rabbinical writings to the yoke of the law. And we understand um, from you know, the, the traditions of the Pharisees that were imposed on the people by the time of Jesus um, were a lot of what wasn't in the law. <laughs> Um, and, and a lot of what was, uh, but, you know, it had evolved way past into a yoke that was uncomfortable. Um, Jesus might also have been including the yoke of Roman oppression. So we think of the, a yoke in this context as um, an entire system of beliefs that the yoked person is required to submit to a whole system of beliefs that the, the person who is yoked is being required to submit to. And instead of that image of being uncomfortably or even cruelly yoked, Jesus was saying, no, that's, that's not my yoke. That's not the yoke that I'm inviting you into. Um, my system is different. <laughs> You know, it's full. It's full of our heavenly Father's love and His goodness and His gracious. His His yoke is kind, and and the burden is light. And the you know the word rest that appears twice in these three verses. Um, it's it's almost paradoxical. Like you know, I think especially um, in. In the United States in this day and time, and I'm, I'm sure it is, you know, Pat in Europe and um, in Spain and all over the world, it's tough. You know, the news is tough. What, what is going on in the government of the United States is um, exasperating. And, you know, it's understandable that we might struggle with rest. And yet it's a promise and we can wrap our arms around it. And a key <laughs> to doing that is spending time with God in meditation. So I had one more question that I needed to answer in my heart <laughs> in order for, for this to be complete in my mind. And that is, what about the epistles? Do the epistles instruct us? born again Christians to meditate. And again, <laughs> it would be um, a challenging project for you to read through from Romans through, you know, the end of Jude. 
and, and see if you found anything that implied meditation. The word meditate is in the King James Version in 1 Timothy. And I want to read that. Of course, I'm reading from the REV, but um, I want to read the section of scripture where it appears because um, it's very, it's, it just flows so with what we're talking about in terms of meditation being active and engaged. So um, in 1 Timothy, we'll pick it up in verse 4. Um, of course, this is Paul writing to Timothy. It's toward the end of, of Paul's ministry. It's in between his two imprisonments. So Paul is not in prison when he wrote 1 Timothy. He was when he wrote 2 Timothy. Um, and Timothy uh, was um, in Ephesus, I believe. So we'll pick it up in verse uh, 12. Actually, did I, if I said 4, I meant 12. And Paul writes to Timothy these encouragements. Let no one look down upon you because you're young, but be an example to those who believe in speech, in conduct, in love, in faithfulness, in purity. Until I come, give attention to public reading, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not ne neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you and then confirmed through prophecy when the council of elders laid hands on you. And that gift is referring to Timothy's ministry, not the gift of Holy Spirit. And here it is in verse 15. In the REV, it reads, keep cultivating these things. This is where in the King James, it says meditate on these things. You know, as it turns out, it's not a meditate is not a particularly good translation of the word that the Greek word that's behind the phrase keep cultivating in the REV. But the sense of this section of scripture is very much what we're talking about. To keep cultivating these things, be devoted to them so that your progress is obvious to all. I think the NIV reads be diligent, where the REV reads keep cultivating. And the things that Paul was talking about were, you know, living as good Christians, right? Um, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faithfulness, in purity, all these things that we heard in the manifestations this morning. Um, so anyway, I want to close um, in, we'll, we'll go full circle and go back to the Psalms. And we'll go to Psalm 104 for our closing verse. Psalm 104, like, like many Psalms, like we saw in Psalm 119, in Psalm 19, um, closes with a prayer. We'll pick it up in verse 31. May the glory of Yahweh endure forever. May Yahweh rejoice in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to Yahweh as long as I live. I will make music to my God while I have any being. May my meditation be pleasing to him. I will rejoice in Yahweh. May sinners perish from the earth and may the wicked be no more. Bless Yahweh, O my soul. Praise Yah. And so, you know, that's our prayer as well. May May the med meditations of our hearts be pleasing to God to the end that we rejoice in him at all times. So that is what I wanted to communicate about meditation. And I hope what you've gotten out of this is a picture that spending time with God is not a checklist, you know, prayer, check, done, <laughs> meditation, check done, study, check, done. But it's an, it's an all day long exchange um, that is very active, that's engaged, that involves uttering, muttering, pondering, singing, even moaning and complaining. Um, it's real, uh, it's honest. And the end of it is obedient conduct which of course is pleasing to God.
I have a closing song for you to ponder. <laughs>